What mention the form of the transaction this needs to be improved. So we have a lot of the this is mine, yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah, they have all kinds of connectors. So. Please be gentle. Okay? Be gentle with the with us. With us. Oh, not broken. Breaking. <laughs> I thought yeah, it was, I was worried about the break. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, well, uh, I'll come back for the last talk of, of today. It's been a really nice day here. And uh, Martin Prochansky will conclude with his discussion of positivity and the loop equation. Okay, is the microphone okay? Yeah. So first I wanted to thank Alexei, Igor, and all the other organizers for the opportunity to give a talk. And I'm gonna start, uh, before I start the talk, I want to discuss an idea that is gonna be important for us. And it's in physics and mathematics, there are structures that, as we know, are, uh, we can call them rigid. For example, a crystal, if I have a crystal, I know the position of some atoms, I can know the position of all of them integral series, analytic functions. If I modify an analytic function at one point, I have to modify it everywhere. And these structures can be determined generally from general constraints many times, or at least approximated. And the interesting constraint we're going to consider for this talk is positivity. More part in particular, we will have always some uh, matrix that is positive semi-definite. Uh, standard examples are if I have the correlation functions of some a random variables xi, and I multiply this matrix by x, xi i xi j, where this is an arbitrary vector. I get the expectation value of the square of something that has to be positive for any xi, and by definition, that means that this matrix is positive semi-definite. And again, if I have a matrix time is dagger, it's positive semi-definite, the matrix of scalar products. And in other situations, if I have a probability measure or any positive function and integrate a positive polynomial is, will be positive and that gives rise to this momentum or properties of the moment of this distribution. So what I'm gonna try to use is this type of positivity in lattice gauge theory. I'm gonna describe the single plaquette model or unitary matrix model and lattice gauge theories in two, three and four dimensions. And the idea is that lattice, this uh, positivity allows the formulation of the theory purely in, gauge in terms of gauge invariant quantities, as I want to discuss. And then I'm going to de uh, define other uh, cases that were already presented. Uh, actually, Yuan Xing gave a very nice talk this morning, and perhaps I'm giving the boring version of his talk. So, so what do we do in lattice gauge theory? So I'm going to start, I'm going to describe this uh, older paper we wrote. And uh, then I'm gonna mention the new results of Kasakov and Zheng that improve very much in what we did and uh, makes this more realistic. And the motivation, as I said, is if can one define a gauge theory purely in terms of gauge invariant quantities? ADS-CFP gives a possibility in terms of a string theory, but I want to consider the more standard version, which is, can we define it as a theory of Wilson loops? And the idea was to use the migdal makenko loop equation. And if you solve the loop equation, then you have an expectation value of the Wilson loops without any reference to the gauge degrees of freedom. However, uh, what I'm going to argue is that the loop equation uh, generically has infinite number of solutions and the positivity condition is what chooses the correct one. So let's start by the single matrix model. So I have a unitary matrix with some action and I want to compute this integral, moreover, I want to compute the same integral with trace of u to the n, normalize these matrices are SUN matrices with capital N, and this W little n I'm gonna call the Wilson loop, and I want to compute these quantities without doing this integral. And this was done by Gross and Witten in the 80s and by Badia uh, using analytical tools with the spectral density, uh, by Friedan using the loop equation, and later, Marchesini, for example, described a numerical method that didn't work so well, but it was good for us to motivate us in this work. So the exact solution has a third order phase transition at lambda equals to one for the expectation value of the plaquette or the just u, the trace of u, which is the, the energy, basically. So if you do a change of variables in the integral and say that the integral should not change, one gets a schwinger dyson equation or equation of motion, and this gives a recursion equation for these expectation values. So if somebody gives, well, W0 is just one, W1 is what we would like to compute, uh, but I don't know it, then I can compute W2, W3, and all the others. But the question is how do we get W1? 
And if one puts W1 and does the recursion relation, one sees that for some values of W of W1, the recursion relation blows up. And this has to be bounded between minus one and one. So that value of U is not good. But can we do that more precise? And what we argue is the following. Suppose you have a linear combination of these matrices U to the N. These are, these are arbitrary complex coefficients. We BB dagger, as we said, is positive semi-definite. So I take the trace, just that should be positive. Uh, the mean value of a positive quantity is positive, and these are unitary matrices. Matrices, so this is u to the power of n minus m. The expectation value is w n minus m. And that means that if I arrange this mat this expectation values in this diagonal, this matrix should be positive definite wherever I stop writing this, because these coefficients were arbitrary. So that means that I put this one, I put this u. And all this I put from the recursion relation and I check if this matrix is positive definite or not. And if I put four by four, I get that U has to be in this region. If I put six by six is here and eight by eight is almost equal to the exact solution of Gross and Witten, which is here. And if you do, you can do I mean, much bigger and then it, you don't distinguish it from the exact solution. Uh, for example, you can do similar things as I'm going to describe later by Hermitian matrices as one very nice paper by Henry Lin. In that case, U dagger is U, so you get N plus M uh, when you write this matrix. But, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I should mention, thank you very much. Uh, all that I'm saying today is in the limit of N goes to infinity. So I'm not going to say anything about finite N. Very, yes, yeah, sorry about that. And in particular here, you get the expectation value of this product and um, because of the large n, it factorizes in the product of the expectation values. And uh, there are also extra terms on the right-hand side that go away. Yeah, thank you, sorry about that. And one can write an effective uh, action, for example, in the two dimension, in this case, for a single matrix model, which is an effective action for the Wilson loops. And uh, if you minimize this action, you immediately see that you get that all the Ws are zero except W1, that from here, when you minimize, you get one over two lambda, that's the strong coupling result. But the weak coupling result does not appear unless you minimize the action with the condition that this uh, sometimes called Teplis matrix, which has this organization of the, of the diagonals is positive semi-definite. Um, this uh, semi-definite programming problem can be solved with very many different types of uh, software packages and is pretty standard. And the constraint, as I just showed, uh, appears at weak coupling. I think uh, yeah, Vicky or, uh, emphasized uh, also many long time ago that the Jacobian of the change of variables from the U to the W should be positive and so there's always some positivity in all the formulations. So in lattice gauge theory, I'm gonna consider a two, three and four D, but I'm gonna draw just a two D. So we have in each link of the lattice a SUN matrix. And I have a plaquette, which is just a square. And if I multiply these matrices and I take the trace, that's the action, some overall plaquette with all the orientations. And a Wilson loop is a closed path. So I multiply the matrices associated with each link. I take the trace and I put it inside the integral and that's the uh, with expectation value of the Wilson loop. And we want to compute those without doing the integral once again in the large end limit. And uh, this uh, can be done in Monte Carlo. Some result, well, this is exact. As I mean, well, I should say in two dimensions, by uh, correct. Uh, choice of gauge, you can reduce it to a single plaquette model. So that's the 2D case of growth with and Vadia. In uh, three and four dimensions, you can do Monte Carlo. Uh, for example, uh, Tepper, Campostrini uh, found a large N, well, like for enough N, there is this uh, phase transition, third order and first order. Okay, so what's the loop equation? As I said, this was done, uh, associated with Big Dal and McKenk, although uh, Eguchi, Ferster, Vadi, I think, and many other people discuss this, discuss this type of finger Duffman equation associated with one link. So I have a link of the lattice and I do a transformation of that matrix. And I say that the integral should not change. And what you get graphically is that you take some Wilson loop through this link 
and you replace it by making a little curl minus making the curl the other way that gives you like this kind of hook. If the loop goes twice or more through the link, you get uh, to split this loop in two by interchanging the entrance here, and you get two Wilson loops that factorizes in the large end. And uh, as Eric was saying, and then uh, if you put the uh, one loop one way and it goes the other way, it also factorizes, but in this, you close it here, and this goes with a minus sign. So once again, the loop equation has a linear term from here, has the same Wilson loop. And if it goes uh, through a uh, Wilson uh, line twice, you get a quadratic term like before. Here I just separated the plaquette, but you can write it like this. And that's good for any action that is written in terms of Wilson loop. So instead of contracting with a plaquette, you contract with a rectangle or whatever other uh, loop you have in the, in the action. So how do we solve this? Well, we can uh, enumerate the Wilson loops, like the square, the rectangle, the chair, maybe you call it, and some other, you make a list. It's a big list, but in the fits in the computer, and then you write equations for them. And we try to solve this equation. And we have the same but worse problem as in a 2D or single matrix model, which is that uh, if I write the equations for Wilson loops, let's say up to length 12, I will have like 5,000 equations, but this will involve loops with lengths L plus four. And that means that there will be like 4 million variables. And that obviously there will be a lot more solutions for that. And if I keep increasing L, that keeps increasing by getting worse because the number grows exponentially. So uh, there is an infinite number of solutions. So how do we choose the correct solution? Well, we need to import some positivity. And uh, what do we do? Well, we take, uh, let's say, two points of the lattice, and we take a set, we choose a set of uh, open paths from one to the other. Now, given the configuration of the lattice, for each open path, I multiply these matrices, and I get a matrix for this path, for this uh, the green path, the purple, the black, and then I make a linear combination of those matrices with arbitrary coefficients. I say this is positive, uh, but now these don't cancel because they are usually unless L is equal to L prime. What this means is I go along the path L prime and then I come back along the path L. That means that this trace corresponds to a closed Wilson loop going along L prime and coming back along L. And when I take expectation value, this should be positive. So that means that these are uh, Wilson loops. If I organize its expectation values with some loops in a matrix, that matrix should be positive definite. So not only should these uh, numbers be obey this equation, they should obey that put, it, put in this matrix is a positive semi-definite. Now, if I normalize this with L, the trace is this matrix is one, so it's positive semi-definite, the trace is one, I can uh, think of it as a density matrix. So I may be curious what happens if I take the compute this entropy, and this entropy is the information you lose by taking the trace over the color indices. And so this is an entropy that I can define again purely for the Wilson loop. So if I give, if you give me the expectation value or whatever numbers the Wilson loops are, I can compute this uh, here. So it has some sort of physical interpretation. And if I, instead of trying to compute the Wilson loops with the loop equation, let's say I use the Monte Carlo, I replace, I compute this entropy. You see that this entropy uh, that only involves the Wilson loops has a jump at the phase transition that you have in four dimensions. And this is a large temperature regime. The entropy is large, and this is large temperature. There is no temperature here, but a lambda can be thought as a temperature decoupling. So when lambda is large, you have random matrices. And when lambda is small, you have matrices all close to identity, and the entropy is very low. Ah, well, I choose this and this, this and this, I choose different ones. And all seem to have very similar entropy. These are the different colors. So it seems to be somewhat independent of what initial and final points we choose. Ideally, you choose all of them and you get the more constraints. 
but we saw that just choosing, we usually choose this and this and take uh, enough uh, open Wilson loops that give some good constraint, but uh, you could add more here. Yeah. Usually you have a bunch of matrices that they should be positive semi-definite. Now there is a very interesting thing, which is what happens at the boundary of this space. So uh, the matrix should be positive semi-definite. So the boundary is when one eigenvalue becomes zero. Then uh, after that, it will be negative. So let's call C0L the eigenvalue. So if I compute this, uh, that should be zero by definition of zero eigenvalue. But if we go back to this definition, we have that this uh, with expectation value is zero, but the expectation value of uh, something that is always positive is zero, means that it's zero for every instance. And that means that this is zero, but if the trace of A dagger A is zero, then the matrix A itself is zero. And that means a very curious property that this matrix with this particular coefficient is zero for any configuration of the lattice allowed by the, the action. And that means that a particular linear combination only at the boundary of the space. A particular linear combination of open Wilson loops uh, vanishes. And that if I close it with another arbitrary Wilson loop, I get a com uh, equation, a linear equation for all Wilson loops. Uh, for example, one can show that if you, the plaquette is one, all the Wilson loops are one using this, so that's the free theory and things like that. So I want to mention the solution by Marchesini that he said, okay, instead of, uh, well, he said, let's close the recursion relation by setting the Sam Wilson loop very large L to zero. And if you do that, you get the polynomial equation for you because all the previous loops are polynomials of you. And you get this very funny shape, which is you get the good result for a strong capping if you choose the lowest root, but here you get something funny. But, but uh, he was satisfied that when uh, L is large, you get the like lower boundary seems to be the correct solution. Ah, sorry, this is the coupling and this is the expectation value of the plaquette. So energy as a function of coupling, it should be uh, one over two lambda here and it should be one minus lambda over two here. And there is a phase transition at one. Yeah, sorry. But essentially, we need to reproduce the, the red curve, which is the exact answer, and the blue curves are the solutions of the polynomial. But this clearly motivates us that, okay, there is a problem, we should be able to do this better. And if you look at the analytic solution, it's important that the spectral density is positive because it's the number of uh, eigenstates in a range. So we said there has to be some positivity condition, and that's how uh, we found that positivity condition that seems to work. Okay, so this is a 2D, as I said, it reduces to the single matrix model. So let's consider 3D. 3D, these uh, red dots are Monte Carlo results. These black are uh, perturbative calculations, so we can ignore. And this is by uh, the upper bound and the lower bound by taking a larger and larger Wilson loop. So you approach this the uh, weak coupling it seems to be very close to the upper bound. So that means that you have this zero mode. And here it's kind of in the middle, although it seems to be closer to the lower bound. And in 4D, you get similar thing. The QCD is here because uh, the lattice spacing lambda should be small because you are because of asymptotic freedom. So here is where you should look at the continuum limit and we didn't do that, but one would like to, I would like to believe that these zero modes that appear here are somewhere related to that, but I don't know how that works. Um, the other thing is that here, you would like to compute large Wilson loops and show that they have obey area law and we are only computing the plaquette, they say, we are not computing large Wilson loops yet. Um, these are just numbers that show that good agreement between our method and perturbation theory and Monte Carlo. One thing I want to emphasize is that these are uh, uh, strict bounds. So although you evaluate the numerical, it's strictly true that the expectation value of the plaquette, ah, sorry, once again, this expectation value of the plaquette versus coupling, they are all the plots like that. And uh, 
this is a strict bound. Although uh, you evaluate the bound numerically, it's strictly true that this matrix is positive definite. And if U is somewhere here or here, it's no longer like that. So it's not a numerical simulation. It's a bound uh, that you evaluate numerically by some computer program. And then we, that we, okay, that's what we did. And we were kind of happy, but more or less, but then Kazakov and Sechuan Zeng, like uh, last year, came up with a much improved numerical approach where they put more constraints and also tackle some of the nonlinear part that we ignore. And okay, I'm not gonna describe too much, but they, they say they improve the method. And now I, I, one can say that the 3D is almost there. I think they have a much better lower bound that goes to one. And with some more effort, one can believe that indeed this method uh, converges to the Monte Carlo solution. In uh, a strong coupling, the, the hacks much more the upper bound, the Monte Carlo solution all the way up to here. So this uh, clearly thinks I would claim that there is good agreement with the Monte Carlo just from this method. Let me argue that this method just uh, is strictly large n. The computations are done using the migdal Markenko loop equation and the positivity condition. So it's purely Wilson loop calculation. There is no a matrices is un in anywhere and so uh, is completely independent so it's not related to the lattice simulations and nevertheless it's the same system but we find the or they found the good agreement and as i said we still need to compute a larger wilson loops so a few random comments one is that uh, although all this done with, is done with the computer one can analytically write analytically write small matrices and for example one can put bounds in the difference between arbitrary Wilson loop and the same Wilson loop with an extra plaquette. Uh, at low, small cap in this U is close to one so this is something small that means that the Wilson loop don't change very much and since you can construct any Wilson loop by adding plaquettes you get bounds which are not that good but bounds on any Wilson loop. You can also see that they are arbitrarily long Wilson loops that you may think, okay, the matrices are random, so she should be zero, but they are not, they are very close to one. So you can get this bound. When U is close to one, this is a little less than one. So they are arbitrarily long loops with the expectation value is one, but they don't have big area, they have big legs. Well, this maybe I will skip, but this is uh, just to mention if you are familiar with Lattice, in Lattice uh, you have a configuration, you want to compute the Wilson loop, but first you smooth out the Lattice configuration to reduce the noise. And one way to do that is what's called gradient flow, that you take uh, some sort of average. But if you look, it turns out that this method to take the average uses the exact same operator that uh, appears in the loop equation. So we didn't write this anywhere, but just an observation that if you flow the Wilson loop, so you take the Wilson loop of the original configuration and of the smooth and out configuration, it's just related by solving this equation. In the large limit, we can drop this. So the smooth out Wilson loop is just some exponential t is arbitrary parameter that determines how much you are smoothing out of the initial Wilson loop. So this smooth and out Wilson loop should obey also a loop equation that is more complicated because the self-intersection, because you are basically decorating the Wilson loop with curls everywhere, it's more, so I don't know if this is tractable, but you get a, a flow loop equation. But the one thing I want to emphasize is that these flowed Wilson loops are compute in smooth out configurations. And therefore it doesn't matter what, if it's smooth out or not, if you compute it for a configuration, it should obey the positivity condition. So the flow Wilson loops, should obey the positivity conditions that means that this exponentiation on this is may give a more constraints. I don't know. So these are just coming. So now I want to, I guess that's about this, uh, what we did and Kasakov uh, and Zheng, Zheng did. And now I want to describe uh, some other work that was already mentioned this morning and I have nothing to do with the rest, but it helped me understand more uh, how this method should work. One is the icing model, it has no large limit, anything, but it has equations by flipping the spin. It's like the Dyson finger equation and has some reflection positivity constraint. 
and the exigence group at uh, Harvard and Barack uh, Gaba is here, so you can ask him uh, more because it's very nice work. They computed uh, for two and 3D uh, IC modes, so I'm just showing 2D, the expectation value of the magnetization as a function of the coupling. Um, it, one can see once again in this region, you get the upper bound agrees with the magnetization. And here you need to do more work, but it's converging. And this is also the correlation between the spin and the neighbor. And it's also converging very nicely to the exact solution. So I think it's quite surprising that one can still think, uh, say new things about the icing model. So, but yeah. Then uh, Henry Ling, uh, some very nice work show how to solve a Hermitian matrix models with this numeric type of numerical method. Let's consider one uh, as he following his paper, one matrix model which uh, has quartic interaction and quadratic. M is Hermitian now, and I want to compute this WNs, the expectation value of trace of M to the N without doing the integral. And once again, in the large N limit, I need to, uh, I can write, uh, just modify M by a little bit, say that the integral does not change because it's a change of variables and you get this loop equation and if i do this linear combination i get that this matrix should be positive definitely now this can be solved exactly so uh, he compared the exact solution and so that the bounds converge very fast to the exact solution once again if you put too many you just don't distinguish the exact solution from the known one but okay he did this for two matrix models uh, and Kasakov then apply this to other models where uh, you do not have any exact solution and they found solutions for those that you can compare with Monte Carlo. So that's a very uh, interesting here. And then I want to mention something uh, related with dynamical systems because uh, at the end there will be some interesting result. This was done uh, by Galushkin uh, previous to what we did. But uh, I learned in a talk from Xi Yin, uh, well, if you look, it might not look similar, but uh, he showed at least me how uh, you can make it very similar to the type of things, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, to the type of uh, problem that we are discussing. So this seems something very different. So I have a dynamical system. You can think of X as position and Y as momentum. Uh, let's say we have this uh, p dot is equal to this, and this is called sometimes the Bogdanov, at least some re reduced version of the Bogdanov system. So I'm following uh, what he showed in the talk, but I'm taking uh, this calculation sum by a student at Purdue for this particular case. So suppose I have uh, this system has periodic orbits in position momentum. This is x and p, sorry, and y but why is like P? And then I have some unbounded orbits. And let's say I take a periodic orbit and I average over a period, X to the N, Y to the M as a function of T. And I want to compute these numbers without solving the differential equation. So how do we do that? Okay, we take uh, some F, X to the P, Y to the Q, take the time derivative and that's P, X, P minus one, X dot, but X dot is Y, so I get Y, Q plus one, and the same with the Y dot. And now F is periodic because it's X and Y are periodic. So if I take time derivative and average, I get zero. And I get this equation once again. So I get one e equation for this W, which is once again a recursion relation uh, that given the initial ones, uh, you can compute the other. But what are the value for initial value for the iteration? And once again, we can do something very simple. We can take linear combination with arbitrary coefficients of X to the N, Y to the M, all square, that should be positive. And it should be positive if I average over an orbit, periodic orbit, but then this thing is by definition, the W N plus N prime, N plus N prime. And this is positive for any coefficients A and M. So if I com consider this composite indices N M, N prime, N prime, then this matrix should be positive semi-definite. And suppose I want the, like, I don't know, in some sense, the Y, the tallest periodic orbit. I can try to maximize W02, that means average value of Y squared. 
And I maximize this with the condition that the recursion relations are satisfied and this matrix is positive semi-definite. And uh, you get uh, the value and this you can compare with what you get from the differential equation and it's the same. But now there is a, this is the thing I want to show because I found very interesting. As I said, I learned it from C in, is that uh, now we say, suppose that we are at the maximum, so at the boundary, at the boundary, we have a zero mode. We have a zero mode of this matrix. A zero mode of this matrix means that if I multiply this by the zero mode, A and M, I should get zero. So this should be zero. But again, this is the average of something positive. So this should be zero without the average. But if this square is zero, this should be zero. So for the particular A and M, this should be zero for any X and any Y. And that means for any T. Um, that sounds strange before with the use, but here, what's this? Okay, if I have an equation that should be valid for any T, this is just the equation of the orbit. So if you look at the zero values of this, you indeed get this shape of the orbit that has the highest Y squared. So we got the physical interpretation for the zero mode. Would be nice to understand better what it is in the other models, but all this allows you to use physical interpretations in one into the other and so on. Okay, so I'm basically done. So to conclude, this positivity can be used with great effect in many different systems. We uh, you, is uh, reduced to the problem of maximization of linear functions in convex spaces. We did it for the lattice gauge theory, and I would like to argue that using the loop equation of Mida and Mankenko plus this positivity, you get a well-defined formulation of the lattice gauge theory for the large limit purely in terms of Wilson loops with no reference to the gauge degrees of freedom. But other people use uh, this for other, I mean, not necessarily our thing, but the same type of idea for other systems and uh, obtain some very important results. And all these results are again rigorous. They are not numerical simulations. They are bounds obtained compute numerically, but they are strict bounds and the general picture is that you have some quantity that has some uh, recursion relation allows you to compute all the values, but you need to know the initial or starting point of the recursion. And uh, the way to find those is to know that this whole set of quantities has to obey some positivity constraints, and therefore you cannot choose the initial values randomly. Okay, that, that's all, thank you. Uh, They will fail what? It's a tentative because the expectation value. Ah, well, uh, this is for the pure This is for, uh, well, no, I don't see how they can fail. These are true for it. So if I have a link, links, and in each link I put a matrix and I don't care what the action is. And my claim is that uh, this matrix is positive definite because of just, uh, it's just this. It doesn't depend on the action. Does theta term give them high in your assessment? It has a weight because there is this complex. Yeah, exactly. So the average there, even though the, the you know the average does not is not guaranteed to be positive, and because the measure is not. Ah, okay. Well, yes. No, this is uh, if you have. Okay, okay. What? Well, Well, Kasakov, they, are, they, um, Zheng, they also added reflection positivity to the equation, but. Uh, well, yeah, well, we are just not putting any, yeah. So if the measure is not positive, then uh, this doesn't work. You know. Ah, yes, yes. So there is some idea that is, uh, you have the same problem in Monte Carlo, then uh, maybe this also doesn't work. I don't know. That. Yeah. That could yeah be. But they could find a method to Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> I, think they, I think David wanted to. <laughs> 
No, that will be nice, yes. So the only thing we were not sure, but the thing we see is that, uh, well, here it converges and using the analytic method that you use, I guess you can, you know that that the solution is unique, but in these cases, Ah, yeah, well, the numerical evidence is this is conversion. Um, uh, now is Yes, yeah, so in this case, there is only numerical evidence. There is no rigorous proof. In the 2D, uh, you know the exact answer, so you can, I guess, use that. Uh, that's what Fridan did. No, no, Fridan did it analytically, but it's just a... Uh, uh, is it? Well, okay, Fridan did. What you do, you write uh, some of uh, some complex numbers, Z to the N, W to the N, that's the resolving or some analytic function, obey some equation from the loop equation. And then you can see that this positivity is equivalent to the positivity of the spectral density and you find a unique solution. So that's, uh, but that only works if you know the exact solution. If you, or well, there is a way to find the exact solution. For, uh, that will be very nice to show that this uh, in 3D, for example, or 4D, uh, this, uh, this will converge to a unique answer. And we don't have any proof like that. It will be nice, yes. It, it will be an important part of the method. Take care. Yeah. Yes. So how, I show one plaquette and I want to. Yes. So, well, it gets harder. Ah, okay. I don't know. So, suppose I have a Wilson loop which is larger, like two. Yes. Then the bounds are, you get bounds, but they are more loose. So, you have to work harder. So, for us, uh, we did try to do the rectangle and it was already, it was close to the numerical result, but not much. I don't know what they obtained for that. But yes, yeah, so the important next step is to be able to compute uh, also larger Wilson loops. In principle, you can do, for example, expectation value of plaquette, expectation value of four plaquettes and plot an allowed region. But we didn't do that, nobody did that yet. No. But that's a, yeah, that's an important thing if you want to go to understand quark anti quark potential or confinement or things like that, you need to compute larger Wilson loops and we don't know how to do that. So in principle here, we get uh, all the Wilson loops because we solve the equation, but they don't have the correct values. The bigger, the worse it is. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, assuming that is positive. I guess I was that caveat that I didn't understand but, uh, before, but yes, yeah, so, so you, sh I mean, you just put some matrix here. And I mean, as I say, the, assuming that the measure is positive, the positivity of this matrix is, is independent of the action. But, uh, uh, but then the question is that you give you some interesting result. For example, this, is always positive and it does not depend on the action as long as the action is positive. Uh, so you can conclude that this is true for any action. Okay. But the, the reason it, it probably is somewhat of a surprise. The reason I'm asking is that I thought that the location of the phase transition can depend on the phase transition. Oh, yes. If the phase transition is bad, it is the phase transition. Yes, yes. So the, that. No, the, the actual value, so this is a, a, a range, but the actual value of this depends on the action. But no matter what the action is, you have this range. Yes. The loop equation indeed, the loop equation is the action basically. So the loop equation is the, is the action. So the, so it's essentially you, if you write the action in terms of Wilson loop, like, like I should did plaquette, you can do rectangle, others. You just intersect them with your Wilson loop 
and that's the linear part. So this equation depends on the action. That's the, inform the dynamical information. The other is kind of kinematical if you want, but it's important. Yes, so people used to usually put actions to have more rotational symmetry, but I don't know yeah, what you are saying. I didn't think about uh, external action. Okay, maybe we can postpone further questions and it's been a long day. So let's thank. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>